Hello and welcome to this HDB BPOA webinar entitled Controlling Minor Pests in IPM Programs. I'm Wayne Brough, uh, HDB Knowledge Exchange Manager. Uh, before I introduce uh, the, the speakers and their presentations, just a few housekeeping points uh, as we're now on uh, Zoom webinars rather than uh, go to webinars. So things may be slightly different from what you're used to with a normal HDB webinar. Uh, so just to move on. Oh, well, there we go. Uh, as, as per the previous webinars, the audience will be on mute, but you are able to uh, pose questions to the presenters. So I'll, I'll go through how you do that in a moment. The actual uh, webinar itself will last around about an hour, give or take five or 10 minutes. It will be recorded. So if you need to come back and, and review or pass it on to colleagues, uh, it, it will be archived and we'll send around the link uh, how to access it af after the webinar is finished in the following days. Uh, in terms of the handout and basis and Neuroso points, uh, uh, the, the forms and the handouts have been sent out prior to the, today's webinar, so you should already have them to hand. Uh, if you do need uh, further copies or you, or you didn't receive them, please have a word with, uh, I'll drop uh, Chris Need an email and he'll be able to sort of send out the appropriate form to you if, if you don't have it. Coming back to the questions uh, and how to pose them, uh, at the bottom of your screen, in terms of the Zoom uh, menu bar, it should be something like that. It may not be identical, but on, on the bottom, there should be an icon which says question and answers, uh, a Q&A function. So if you click that and type in your question, I'll keep an eye on questions as they come through and I'll pose them to the appropriate presenter at the end of the presentation. As I said before, uh, we've got basis and neuroso information, you should already have them, and the webinar is being recorded. So today's uh, webinar uh, consists of two presentations. Uh, we have Alicia and David from, from ADAS talking about controlling minor pests, uh, reviewing pest biology symptoms, uh, how to monitor and the various control measures available. And then we have a, a case study uh, delivered by Mylena from WD Smith & Sons concerning uh, making commercial decisions about uh, pest control uh, in, in general. So uh, for those who, who, do, who don't know today's presenters, uh, Alicia is an entomologist uh, working as, alongside Jude Benison at, uh, at ADAS. She's been involved in a number of AHDB projects. Uh, I think many of you have come across David. David is a consultant with ADAS, uh, providing advice to industry. And uh, again, he, he's worked on numerous AHDB projects, including the Bedding and Pot Plant Centre uh, project, which this is part of. And Mylena is a propagation manager at WD Smith & Sons, uh, who are bedding and pot plant producers at Battlesbridge in, in Essex. And Mylena has been working at the nursery for almost 10 years. Uh, just before I move on to the first presentation, uh, just to let you know, there will be a number of polls uh, throughout. Uh, we will commence uh, with a poll shortly, just to sort of get feedback as to uh, your views and, and how many of you have actually adopting uh, uh, biocontrol in your particular nurseries. There will be a couple of question slides posed by Alicia in her presentation. So we'd welcome your feedback on those just to sort of uh, get an understanding of uh, your knowledge and, and, and whether you can recognize certain elements which are being discussed in the actual presentation. So the, fir the first one is there. So if, if you just take uh, two or three minutes just to sort of click yes or no as to whether you do currently use an IPM for the control of minor pests. And then we'll have a quick uh, review as to how many of you have joined us uh, do or don't. So if I can just leave you to think about that for sort of 10, 15 seconds, and then Chris will show us what the results are. Oh, so we've got a resounding success. Uh, hopefully we're not pre preaching to too many of the converted and, and you will pick up something today from today's webinar, but that's really good to see. We've got a resounding yes in terms of IPM. Uh, so with that in mind, if I can ask the, uh, uh, the other presenters apart from Alicia, just to sort of mute and close their webcams, and we will commence with the technical element of today's presentation. So over to Alicia. If you can unmute Alicia, we can't hear you. 
Great, thanks, Wayne. Um, could you just confirm that you can see my screen, please? Sorry, everything looks fine to me here. I've just muted myself as well. Sorry. Yeah. Perfect. Great. Well, thanks for the introduction, Wayne. Today we're just going to be covering how to control minor pests in IPM programs. And this is a quick overview of what we will be covering. Why are minor pests becoming a major problem in IPM programs? Which ones are the most problematic pests and how these can be controlled in an IPM program, looking at cultural controls, monitoring, uh, biocontrols and pesticides. So why are these minor pests becoming a problem in IPM programs? And this is largely due to um, the loss of uh, broad spectrum in in insecticides as uh, growers are using uh, pesticides which are more targeted towards specific pests. You've got your ma major pests like aphids and thrips and spider mite, and the minor pests are not necessarily being targeted. And some of the control options available for these minor tests are, uh, can be quite expensive as well, and they might not necessarily be a priority, but they can still cause serious damage. So moving on. Unfortunately, we don't have time to go through all the minor pests today, so I will just cover some of the most problematic ones, which are caterpillar, leaf hopper, leaf miner, and Sierra and shoreflies. So why are caterpillars a problem? Well, if left unchecked, they can lead to severe damage, as shown in the pictures in this slide. Caterpillars can cause feeding damage, they can stick leaves together, and they can deposit frass. There are even some stem feeding species which can cause wilting in crops like primula and viola, but this is not a common issue. So there are two main types of caterpillar affecting bedding and pot plants. We've got the leaf holing caterpillars, which cause feeding damage, which starts as a window when a young caterpillar feeds from one side of a leaf, usually the underside, without breaking through the upper epidermis, creating a small window effect. And this can then develop into a small hole, which could easily be confused with slug damage. These caterpillars are mainly from moth species and they feed at night, although the small and large white butterflies can attack uh, ornamental cabbage. I won't go into too much detail on the identification of species today, but some species you may recognize include the tomato moth caterpillar, which can be variable shades of brown with black and white spots and a yellowish line on its side. The adult is light brown with a white W shape on the wing. And then there's the silver Y moth with caterpillar, which is green with dark stripes and a yellow line down its side. The adult has a distinctive silver Y shape on its wings. And there's also the angle shades moth caterpillar, which is a velvety yellow green color. And the adult is green or brown with V shaped markings on its wings. The other type of caterpillar are the leaf rolling species, which roll up leaves and shoot tips with silk so that they can feed under protection from the leaf. This makes them particularly difficult to target with contact acting pesticides and less hit while they are too small to roll the leaf fully. These caterpillars tend to be smaller than the leaf holers and mainly moth species, such as the carnation tortrix and the cyclamen tortrix and the light brown apple moth. The carnation tortrix is a small green caterpillar with a brown head and the adult male and female are brown with different wing patterns, as is the light brown apple moth. Um, the cyclamen tortrix caterpillars are dark green to pale brown with two dark markings on each forewing. So moving on, why are leaf hoppers a problem? Well, you can see on this slide that they can cause a lot of damage as well if left to their own devices. And this is especially so on delicate foliage. Damage symptoms to look out for are white or pale yellow spots on the leaves, which can coalesce to form larger bleached areas, which may also turn brown. Leaf hoppers can leave cast skins on the leaves, which um, can be considered a contaminant by retailers as they are often mistaken for live ones. You can see here, this is a cast skin in this picture. Leaf hoppers are a particular issue because they're very mobile and may escape getting sprayed. Also, because only even low numbers of them can do a lot of visible damage. 
The glass house leaf hopper is the most common species on protodendic plants. The adults are whitish grey with two grey chevron markings on their wings. The sage leaf hopper is more common on herbs, but it can infest salvia. And these ones are pale with green, a pale green, and they have distinctive spots on their body and the wings. So that was leaf hoppers, but what about leaf miners? These can also create a lot of damage, reducing plant quality with their distinctive white mines, as they tunnel between the upper and the lower surface of the leaf, as you can see in the pictures here. Severely mined leaves can even shrivel and die in some cases. The first sign of leaf miner damage is from the adults as they puncture and feed on the leaf, which you can see in this picture here, creating small pale spots. You can see in this picture a lava in its mine. Leaf miners are particularly difficult to target because they are protected by their mines. There are several species of leaf miner, the most common being the chrysanthemum leaf miner, which is a species of chromatomyia. Chromatomyia species pupate in the mine, and the adults look like small, robust flies with a greyish brown body. Whereas Lyriomyzer species drop to the ground to pupate where they can survive the winter. Lyriomyzer species have a distinct yellow spot in their backs. And some species are quarantine pests, such as the South American leaf miner, Lyriomyza huidobrensis. The tomato leaf miner is also a Lyriomyza species, but it is not a quarantine pest. Therefore, if you see any leaf miners with a yellow spot on their back, it is best to contact AFA and to have identification confirmed. Moving on, why are scarred and shore flies a problem? Well, there is a distinct difference in that scarab fly feed on decaying organic matter, plants, and fungi. While they may not cause damage to plants all the time, the larvae can, in some cases, feed on the roots, lower leaves, and stems, and even cause wilting in severe infestations. Whereas shorefly feed on algae and do not cause direct damage to plants, but they can be considered a nuisance to growers and a contaminant to retailers, and their frass can also lower plant quality. To elaborate more on the difference between Ceratocyarid and shoreflies, both are capable of spreading diseases such as Pythium and Fusarium, which can then allow Botrytis in as a secondary infection. Both of them thrive in warm, damp conditions, and shorefly can build up to much higher populations than Ceratofly as they breed so quickly. Seedlings and cuttings are the most susceptible to Ceratofly infestation, as they do not have established root systems. Slow growing plants and blood trays are the most susceptible to shorefly, as the expect exposed wet growing media is a perfect site for algal growth, as are other parts of the nursery, such as capillary matting, bench, and floor co coverings. How do we tell the difference between sarid and shoreflies? I know some of you will be very keen with the hand lens or even have your own microscopes, so I'll go through each stage of the life cycle. Sarid eggs tend to be laid in clumps, and the shorefly eggs are oval and white with a net-like pattern on the surface. Young Sierrad larvae are transparent, but the fourth instar is white, whereas shorefly larvae are always transparent, but they appear brown, as you can see their gut contents. Sierrad pupae are white, but they turn brown as they move to the surface to emerge. Shorefly pupae are brown with their tapered black tips, at the ends. And when it comes to the adults, adult sierrids look like small gnats with long antennae and a Y shape on their wing vein, which you can see here. And shoreflies look more like a small house fly with short antennae and five white spots in their wings, like a domino effect. And you might want to look at some of these features if you're identifying from a sticky trap. So now you'll be wondering how to control these pests within an IPM program. I'm sure that many of you will be familiar with this pyramid of IPM principles, which is a rough guide to implementing IPM. Starting at the bottom, you should focus on cultural controls and preventing an issue from occurring in the first place. However, it's not possible to prevent all pest issues from occurring. So it's a good idea to encourage native beneficials to control the pests so that you don't have to. Inevitably, some pests will still cause an issue, so it's important to monitor pest numbers and establish thresholds for action based on the risk to the crop and its value. 
If action is required, then you should first consider biocontrol agents and biopesticides. If these options are unsuitable, you should then consider IPM compatible pesticides, and as a last resort, use non-IPM compatible pesticides. So we're looking firstly at cultural controls, this is all about prevention, stopping pests coming in and preventing the conditions which favour pest development. Something essential for all pests is inspecting incoming plant deliveries and keeping these in a quarantine area until they've been given the all clear. You can prevent pests coming into a glass house from the environment with mesh on the vents and by asking staff to wear PPE before entering high value crops. Looking at these pests specifically, it's important to dispose of old stock and bag up material in situ to prevent pests being spread around the nursery. Leaf minor mines can be picked off too. It's, it's also important to control weed hosts around the nursery, such as chickweed, which is a favourite of leafhopper, and sow thistle and groundsel, which are popular with leaf miner. You could consider using crop covers if suitable to prevent flying pests from accessing the crop and laying eggs. And for Sierra and shorefly, it's very important to over avoid overwatering, as this leads to fungal and algal growth and the damp conditions favoured by these pests. Ventilation can help keep surfaces dry when the crop demands a lot of water. And it's best to cover any unused growing media stocks to prevent eggs from being laid there. So how do we encourage native biocontrols to do the hard work for you? Well, um, IPM systems will naturally benefit our native helpers as they are knocked out by broad spectrum insecticides. One of the most important points is to be able to recognise native biocontrol agents so that they're not considered a threat and removed. I've included some of the less well-known ones on this slide, such as Anagris, the parasitic wasp, which parasitizes leaf miner, and this used to be commercially available, but no longer is. And this picture shows a Sierra larva infected with furious spray. <coughs> there are several naturally occurring entomopathogenic fungi, which are not commercially available. And if you are able to recognize these, you can spread the fungal spores around the nursery. Sierra larvae will feed on fungi, so they will ingest this fungus and become infected with it. This picture here shows the hunter fly, which will catch several day daytime flying pests, such as shorefly, whitefly, and leaf miners on the wing. Afarita debilitata is a natural parasitoid wasp of shorefly larvae, and Cartesia glomerata is a parasitoid wasp of caterpillars. Adult wasps and other beneficials, such as hoverfly, tend to feed on pollen and nectar. So it's important to provide access to flowering plants, even on a bedding nursery, where you might assume there would be lots. For other predators, there are an increasing number of food supplement products available on the market for boosting biocontrol agents, but some of these may also benefit natural enemies, such as predatory mites. And speaking of wasps, the common, the common wasp gets a lot of stick for being a nuisance. And while you might not want to encourage them, it is worth respecting that they are a valuable apex predator that will hunt all sorts of insects, such as caterpillars and flies. And some weeds are also very valuable, such as nettle, which can be an important habitat for some beneficial insects. So once you have implemented your cultural controls and encouraged natural enemies, you'll need to monitor the crop to keep an eye on the pests. And be sure to not just look in the obvious places, but check beneath pots, under rims, and the underside of leaves. Don't just look for the pest itself, but look for signs of it, like a detective would, with at least a 10 times magnification hand lens or greater. Look for signs such as frass, damage, cask in, and rolled leaves. A quick guide to tell the difference between scarred and shore flies when you're crop walking is that scarred flies will fly weakly around the growing media, whereas shore flies tend to sit still until disturbed and then they will fly off quickly. It's very helpful to train all your staff to recognize pests, not just the crop walkers, and to make sure that they know who to report it to when they spot something. You can also bring the pest to you for counting using sticky traps. Large insects may be able to walk off of a dry glue trap, but small insects and those with wings will stick easily. It's important to check traps regularly as caught insects will start to degrade and it will become more difficult to tell what you've caught. 
For most pests, it's best to use yellow sticky traps around 10 to 20 centimeters above the crop to reduce beneficial bycatch. Roller traps for mass monitoring are being used on some nurseries to cover a much larger area. Some insects, such as male moths, can be lured to a hanging trap with a pheromone. If using pheromones for different species, it's best to keep the traps apart to avoid confusion. A little trick for monitoring uh, scarab fly larvae numbers is to place a potato chunk on the growing media, which will then draw them to the surface for counting. And all this information can be input into a decision support system. There are several commercially available, or you may have even developed your own. It's a good idea to keep a record of all your monitoring results so that they can be compared year on year and used to inform your control decisions. So I mentioned earlier looking for signs of pests such as frass, and here's a little challenge to see if you're all awake. I'd like you to take a look at the, at the pictures here for about 10 seconds and then a pop-up poll will appear on your screen. I'd like you to answer the question, which of these pictures show caterpillar frass? And I'll give you a clue, there are more than one of them. This also gives me a chance to have a quick drink while you make your choice. I'll allow a bit of time for possible lag and could we could we close the poll and, and have the results? Oh, very, very, very interesting. I can see definitely the majority of you have, have got this correct. Um, the correct answer is a, C and D all show caterpillar frass. And as a general rule of thumb, the bigger the caterpillar, the bigger the frass. Uh, picture B shows some very tiny frass, which actually belongs to thrips. And here is another one. <laughs> In this picture, take a few, maybe a bit longer to look at this one. It's slightly more difficult. Can you identify the damage in this picture from a leaf hopper? And the pole should but should pop it up again soon. <coughs> Slightly more tricky, but I, I hope you will have all answered that by now. Could we have the results, please? Definitely the majority wins again, I can see. So D is the correct answer here. That shows leafhopper damage, whereas A and C are spider mite damage and B is thrips damage. Well done to everyone for paying attention. <laughs> so after monitoring and deciding to take action, what are the biocontrol options available for these pests? Well, one option is nematodes. You have Steinonema cavacaxi, which can be used to control caterpillars and shorefly larvae. Steinonema feltii can be used for caterpillars, sierrid larvae, and leaf minor. The nematodes enter their host and release a bacterium which causes the host to die, as you can see in this picture here. They can be applied as a spray or through irrigation, and it's very important to agitate the solution and check the size of your filters on your equipment. If the filters are too small, nematodes will not be able to come out. It's also advisable to allow time for the solution to travel through a long hose or irrigation pipes and check what is coming out at the end. You should be able to see the nematodes wiggling around with a hand lens. Nematodes should be stored in the fridge and not applied in direct sunlight as UV can be damaging and they will not survive for long on the dry leaf surface if applied to foliage. Now, the keen eyed amongst you may have seen trichogramma mentioned in the handouts, which we have amended. And I'll just update you that unfortunately, this egg parasitoid is no longer licensed for release in the UK, so it can't be used. But there are other bio, bio control options which can be used and include Macrolophus pygmaeus, 
which is a generalist that is mainly used for control of white fly in tomatoes and aubergines, but it can also be used to control caterpillar, leaf hopper, and leaf miner. Caution is advised if you're introducing to ornamental crops, as this has not been widely tested yet. In tomatoes, this predator does so well that it can multiply to high numbers and can cause some damage to the crop. It's not advisable to use this on any crops that are susceptible to ligus damage. And as with all biocontrols, it's important to check with your biocontrol supplier whether there are any licensing restrictions for their use. There are two parasitoid um, wasps available for control of leaf miner. Dacnusa subirica is an endoparasitoid. It lays its eggs inside the larva, but this allows the larva to continue to cause damage until it pupates and the wasp emerges. Whereas Diaglyphus isaia is an ectoparasitoid, which lays its eggs on the surface of the larva, killing it and stopping the mine a lot more quickly. Both the adult and the larvae of this parasitoid need to feed on leaf miner larvae. So then they can control the pest more quickly, but they do really need high pest densities to, to be effective. Delosia curiaria is a ground-dwelling predatory rove beetle that will eat scarred and shorefly in all stages and also thrips. This beetle can be reared on the nursery. My colleague Jude Benison wrote a fact sheet about how to do this and some biocontrol suppliers are selling ready-made rearing systems with instructions. Um, it is advisable to not overwater or overfeed the culture if you're rearing your own to prevent the growth of fungi. Um, the predatory mites, Stratiolalaps and Macrocellis are also efficient predators, Ziarid and shoreflies and thrips, and they, they are compatible with each other, but these mites are considered incompatible with Delosia coriaria as they will feed on each other's young. And now I'll pass over to David to cover pesticide options in an IPM program. Thanks Alicia. Um, firstly, brief apologies, I had some computer issues joining, so hopefully you can hear me because I'm through the phone. Can, am I loud and clear? I can hear you David. Great, good. Okay, so <clears throat> will IPM compatible pesticides control these pests? So yes, we've got a number of options. Um, good old Dipole DF, Bacillus thundriensis, which has been about for many years for caterpillar control. The key to getting success with this product is getting caterpillars with, when they're small. And for the tortrix type species and light brown apple moth species, leaf rolling species that Alicia has covered, the key to success is, is thorough monitoring and getting the caterpillars well small before they start to web leaves together. Um, and a, a really good grower tip we've gathered um, from Malina, Malina, who's talking toward the end of a presentation, um, they found that raising the temperature to eight degrees for a day in winter encourages feeding and enables you to get this product to work when temperatures are cold and, and caterpillars can be quite sluggish and, and not inclined to feed under normal circumstances so that's a useful tip people might like to try um, we've also got conserve that's uh, contact and ingested um, we've got contacts and leaf actin products contact actin products for, for cool spruce it can use for leaf hopper and then a range of physically disabling products um, for a range of pests listed there um, and then uh, translamina insecticide dynamic abamectin for uh, <coughs> control of leaf miner larvae. Okay, next slide, Lithia, please. <coughs> so the next question is, can conventional pesticides be used in IPM programs? Yes, the IPM compatible ones can. So we've covered quite a few on the uh, previous slides. Some others not mentioned include the systemic and translamina pesticide sequoia, next slide, um, systemic products such as Mainman, um, which is quite similar to Chess, when, for those of you that use Chess in the past, we no longer have Chess, um, Gazelle SG, but I'm conscious that a lot of growers don't use Gazelle, with it being a near nicotinoid, because their customers don't like to use those, that group of insecticides, or that's the only one left in the group available to us. Um, 
Other things that can be considered include malting inhibitors, such as applaud, and uh, we've covered most of the others. So next slide, please. We'll start to focus down a bit. So we've got a few bioprotectants we can use for pest control. Um, just a note with Botanigard, it's for use in permanent protected in, per, under permanent protection with full enclosure, so basically a glass house. Um, we've already covered Dipole and Naturalis is another option, but it's the, the same fungus basically as Botanigard. Next slide then, please. So currently there's limited knowledge on the effectiveness of bioprotectants for control of the pests we're focusing on today, um, with the main one being dipol for caterpillars. So uh, there's a limited gap in the knowledge there. So we are quite reliant on the conventional IPM compatible insecticides. So next slide, please, Alicia. And this slide covers the, the products we can use, um, gives their mode of action, which uh, is important to, to understand to get the best from them. So um, when, when using physical products, um, even if you're targeting something like leaf miner, leaf miners dwell on, sorry, leaf hoppers, um, leaf hoppers dwell on the underside of a leaf. So we know achieving spray coverage on the underside of a leaf is difficult, regardless of what spray application system you use. So if you are using these physical type products for control of leaf hoppers, one application is unlikely to give you control. It's going to be a, a program of applications of those sorts of products. Um, and the same with contact acting products like Spruzit. But if you use Spruzit, it, it's, it's too per crop, so you can't go with a program of Spruzit. You'd have to mix it up with the, the physical type products we've just mentioned. So some pests, such as the leaf hoppers, some of the systemics will give you a better better control um, because they'll get the pest moving through the plant sap stream. Um, just a note of caution with the time of year, um, they'll still be effective at the temperatures we've got now, but in the coming months, temperatures will drop and it will get too cold for these systemic products to work to their, their best ability. So if you are using them as as we move into autumn, and picking a bright sunny day, we'll get the best results from them. Um, just a note of caution with Dynamic on, on, on that note, um, just to remind people really that it uh, degrades rapidly under bright sunny conditions. So that's one to apply on a dull day or late in the day. Um, we shade screens across to, to minimize the, the bright light breaking that one down. Um, so quite a lot of information there, how many you can apply per crop or per year. Um, we've listed the IRAC codes, those are insect resistance action committee codes. So it's useful to mix products up, um, use products with different IRAC codes to present resistance developing whenever you're controlling pests. Next slide, please. So folks, we've talked about a lot of products. Um, which products can we think about for which pest? So this table seeks to control this, seeks to address this point. Um, and you can see leaf hoppers got the most options really. Um, and uh, we've got a couple of options for caterpillar um, um, and uh, leaf miner got another couple of options for just just a point with leaf miner, scarred and shorefly. Products such as Eradicote, Eradicote Max, in that line of the table, they're only likely to knock down your adult population that you hit. Um, so they're, they'll give some knockdown, but they're not going to be the complete solution. You need to address the whole life cycle as has been covered in other slides during this presentation to get total control. Okay, next slide, please. So, talked a lot about the different pests and now focusing on a control strategy for caterpillars. Monitoring is the first important point um, because as we said 
we we reliant on Dipel for our main bioprotection for Casper looking for and we need to get that on when Casper look is small to get a good kill. Um, and caterpillars are generally easiest to kill when small, regardless of what product you're using. Um, certainly IPM compatible ones. Um, disregard the trickler grammar in this slide because, as we said, that's sadly lost its license in the UK. So we can't consider that one anymore. Uh, it's just not available. Uh, nematodes are another option people might not have tried. Um, and if you perhaps missed the boat with your dipel or agree 50 is not strain of bacillus thundriensis, um, it could be worth giving nematodes a try to, to knock out some slightly larger caterpillars. Um, conserves another option, we just note it's harmful to parasitic wasps if you're using those to control of other pests. And then spruce it sort of our default for larger caterpillars, certainly in IPM systems. And um, we don't want to be using any pyrethroids because of the, the disruption they cause to IPM systems for up to three months. They leave persistent residues and uh, really prevent a lot of our predators establishing and doing what they should be doing. Next slide, please. So moving on to leaf hopper, <coughs> monitoring again is key. And uh, the picture there you can see sort of leaf hopper and you often get, because they molt, they go through their life stage as you get the car skins left on the underside of the leaves, which is quite a, a useful monitoring aid and a clue to the, which pests causing the damage. Um, they often tend to build up on older stock that's hanging about for a bit too long. So just making the point, if it's not realistically going to sell and it's got leaf hopper infestation, it's often best to talk call time on the crop and, and think maybe I'm best to get rid of it rather than it just to harbor pests such as leaf hopper that can move into my newer, fresher crops that are coming through through the system. Um, as we said, a couple of options to control, regular action applications of physically disabling products or systemic insecticides. And, and the choice of which strategy you take will be limited by time of year. But um, if you have got leaf hoppers about, it's worth trying to control them now when you've still got sufficient temperatures to make the best of those systemic products before you're forced just to rely on those physically disabled products, which uh, might might be a bit more challenging to achieve total control of this pest. Okay, next slide. So thinking about scarred fly, again, monitoring is important. Um, careful watering is extremely important. And I always say watering is one of the most important jobs on the nursery. Um, it's a very skilled job, and sometimes it's given to, to people that aren't skilled, particularly skilled um, and don't have a, the plant knowledge that they perhaps need to do a good job of watering because there's so much to consider what the weather's doing. And we don't want to be soaking things up as we move into autumn, winter on a Friday, getting through the weekend if it's a wet, grey weekend forecast and knowledge of the plant that they're watering. We don't want something to be soaked up that's prone to root rots. Um, so once you've got your watering right, you'll reduce the incidence of scarred flies, but you also need to get your drainage and your beds right. So any poorly drained areas of beds will just be a, a problem for scarred flies that will persistently occur really. Um, so addressing the root cause by sorting that drainage out is a, a very important point in time well, and effort well spent. So predatory mites can be used and can be very effective. Um, <clears throat> we've got a couple of options there and uh, Delosia cordata, previously called Theta, is the other option and people quite often like using that in propagation in the rearing system that Alicia mentioned and a lot of people have a lot of success with that predator and breeding it up themselves and and it's become a, a mainstay to control for, for many. Um, nematodes are another option and we've got a nice image there of nematodes um, taking out the scarred, ultimately scarred larvae and uh, we mentioned the physically disabling type products for knocking down adults where you've got um, high infestation of, of adults just to bite 
perhaps buy you a bit of time or knock them down. Will you address the, the root cause? They can flare up if, the, if things get a bit wet, particularly in newly potted stock. Okay, so thinking about control for shore fly, quite similar to scarred in many ways, but uh, slightly different pests. So monitoring is important. The same messages with watering um, and similar predators really. Uh, except the nematode, just worth pointing out, you need different species there for best results um, compared to when you're targeting scarred larvae. So it's important if you are using nematodes to, to accurately identify whether you've got scarred or shore fly, it's very likely you've got both, um, but uh, that's, that's something to be aware of really on individual nurseries. Okay, next slide. Please. So, moving on to leaf mi miners, monitoring the key and uh, looking for the adult feeding marks is a good good thing to do when you crop monitoring crop walking, and that is the first alarm that you've got the pest about, and also keep, keeping your eyes peeled for the presence of adults in the crop, um, and perhaps caught on sticky traps. Um, then contact acting and physically disabling products may help control adults, but they're quite big pests to take out with those types of products. So often we focus on control of the larvae using products such as Dynamec and Conserve. But as has been said previously, if you've got a low level of damage, it's well worth picking off and disposing of, of leaves. Um, and also just flagging up the point the uh, adult picture on the left with that yellow spot, Lirio mite species, the well worth checking out and getting it identified um, to confirm that it's not a, a problem, no viable species. Um, so, leaf minor adults can actually be identified from sticky traps if they're a fairly good specimen. So uh, if you do catch one with a yellow spot on a, a sticky trap and it's still in fairly good state, it can be identified by that. That's well worth remembering. Okay, that's all from me and Alicia. Um, we'd also like to thank Chloe, Jude Benison, Chloe Whiteside, Jude Benison and Jill England who all contributed to the, the writing and creation of this presentation and shared pictures they've gathered over the years as well. So we can pass over to Mylena um, for a little case study of how they manage things at WD Smith and Son. Thank you, Mylena. Hello, everybody. Uh, I hope uh, I'm going to be really helpful for you. So I'm currently working for WD Smith and Son, and I'm going to ask Elijah if she can do the next slide, please. Uh, how you can see, it's a two questions, and I'm not here to be talking or showing you any numbers, what we've been spending and what we've been saving, but I just really point that slide only because I'm really wondering how many of you know how much do you spend until your crop go on the market. And is it any way you can reduce your cost so you can be a lot more better for the future. Uh, uh, if we can go for the next slide, please. Right, here at WD Smith & Son, we really rely a lot on the biological control and thanks to it, we really reduce the labor and the cost of the chemicals. To be honest, we are using mostly biological control on our long crops, like acicromans and primroses. And thanks to all of that, whatever we are using, we found out that we really don't do a lot of spraying. I know that the webinar is about the minor pests, but it is really important for people to start asking them about the other stuff, like uh, what do you do in your crops about aphids, about 
how we've been talking before and probably in the other webinars about white fly, about strips, about spider mites. So we find out that thanks to everything, whatever is on the market, help us a lot to reduce the springs. It helps us to reduce the labor, especially those days, you know how expensive is the labor. And the thing is that if you really would like to find the best way uh, to use the, the best of your biological control, you really have to know how to apply it and when to apply it, because that is really important. And that's what we found over here. So about the minor pests, how you all hear, what we're doing at WDS Unit and said, we currently don't use any biological control only because whatever is on the market, it's not suitable for us and for the time of the year when they're coming. We do rely a lot on the sticky traps. And if we, and that's what we're doing over here, we <coughs> involving the sticky traps early in the season, early in the summer. So that it's really helpful for us and catching the adults, it's helping us to protect most of the time our crop. If I can have the next slide, please. Yes, we do use protection products and what we to encourage our growers is to be using most of the time bio insecticides. We try most of that only because we start thinking that the effect of the bio insecticides is a lot more better than whatever is on the market from the insecticide. How David mentioned you, we really, reply, we really rely on the DPL and that is the mainly product that solved our problem with the caterpillar we apply it really early when we see the damage. But another thing is that we always try to manage our watering only because we try the chemical to be as long as possible on the plant so that it's gonna give you the best result. So yeah, we do use the powerful caterpillar. We, for leaf miner and leaf hopper, what we are trying, it's really not common on our crops, but mostly we can see it from the long crops, mostly we can see it on the gerbera, on the silver leaf. But over there, we usually use a lot from the flipper and from the main line. And from the main main. Um, if I can have the next one, please. Uh, well, how I was see, how David and Elijah was talking. Yeah, we're doing, for us, it's really important our greenhouses to be clean. It's really important to manage the weed control. We really rely a lot on the sticky traps. And honestly, we really rely a lot on the by insecticide and bio control. That's what is it. And to be honest, what we find out as well is that we always ask, the, we always go to the different suppliers because it's not only one supplier over there. We always talk to the suppliers and with the professionals what is the best for the crops. And always you can get the small tips from the different people. And that's how you're going to find out that you can do your best. And please ask yourself and try to use a lot more bio stuff. So it's really helping and it's really, really worth it. So if you have any questions, we're always open for that. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mylena. If, if we can just leave Mylena's last slide on. So if we do need to go back to refer to any, uh, any of the previous slides, we can quickly do so. Uh, but now we've come to the end of the formal presentation, uh, so I have a few questions I was going to ask, but if any of you still have questions to submit, please click the Q&A uh, button and, and submit them, and we're, we're going to go through them over the next 10 minutes. Uh, so the first one, uh, I don't know if, uh, David, are you still with us? David, are you still there?
perhaps if perhaps if I can pose this to, to uh, Alicia then, and, and perhaps get uh, Mylena's uh, feedback on this particular question. I'm, uh, I'm unmuted, Wayne. If you're ready, sorry. Okay, um, I'm just just wondering uh, that we, we've shown a number of winter autumn crops there uh, in in terms of primroses and pansy. Uh, the question being, is it worth using biocontrol on these crops? So we look. We're looking primarily here for probably for winged biocontrol agents here in the hope that you may get temperatures for two or three hours a day. Or is it best to not not to go down the biocontrol road with, with, with these crops and to rely on physical uh, control? We, we've heard about uh, we can use mass trapping or, or the, the yellow roller traps or perhaps go straight to chemical measures. So I'm just wondering if you had any feedback there on biocontrol in uh, autumn winter crops and is it worthwhile to put them in for two or three hours uh, sufficient temperatures per day? As a general rule in in sort of unheated crops most people tend to see their biocontrol applications about the end of September. Um, it, it starts to become a bit hit and miss whether you will get sufficient temperature for the, the products to do the job. Um, and you can soon be wasting money and not getting the control you want. So as a general rule in unheated crops, sort of to the end, go to the end of September and then sort of start again, typically early April, depending on the spring, really. Um, I don't know whether a list you have anything to add to that, but, but do so if you do. Um, just to add that the Dacnusa sapirica leaf miner parasitoid is is recommended for use over the winter as it and I think both of those species are active at temperatures of about 10 degrees but as as David said you it's it's a numbers game whether you whether it's worth worth doing or not and, and Mylena can I ask for comments for you as to how you approach autumn winter crops at yeah. uh, DVD Smith right we do use biological control and again, against depends on the temperature. If we see that the temperatures are over 10 degrees, we use it. If we see literally our biological control is finishing in the end of October, November, if we see that the temperatures are going up, we always order more. But again, if you have to drop off the temperature of your greenhouses because you need to slow down the production, or the product because it's not a good market or something, then why you're gonna take a biological control in your crop? It's, it's just those small questions that it depends of what do you wanna do and depends what is happening in that time of the year. Yeah, so I, I, that's I agree. And um, we've got a nice comment there from Robin as well, Robin Squan sort of saying, leaf hopper seems to be more active during the winter than aphid. So I guess that's something to bear in mind in that if, if you do see one or two uh, leaf hoppers, then even if the temperatures are quite cool, you, you, you may still have a leaf hopper problem and therefore you will need to think about some sort of physical or chemical treatment as, as per the uh, presentations today uh, uh, to, to, to actually get the control you, you, you're looking for. Um, just moving on to uh, caterpillar control here specifically, uh, and again, we'd probably start with David. If, if, you, if you do see uh, leaf curling uh, and, and webbing and, and you've missed the bolt in terms of your monitoring, I assume at that sort of stage, you, you're, you're straight to a systemic insecticide? Um, <clears throat> so for caterpillars, um, we haven't really got so many systemic insecticides. So uh, you'd be looking for something like bruise it or you could even try the nematodes we mentioned um, for large caterpillars so those are the main options really um, so I, I guess said, I guess then we, we, we might be back to sort of uh, hand as, as Alicia mentioned then probably hand picking where, where if you if you have missed yep. a boat in terms of monitoring unfortunately it's uh, it's just hand picking off when, when you're going around the crop and, and doing any cleaning yeah, yeah, and I mean that that is something that people do with the tortoric species in particular, the, like brown apple moth, because when they, depending on how how well webbed they are together, so to speak, 
if you catch them early, you might get some control. But when they're really webbed together, the leaves, they, they effectively create themselves a little umbrella to feed under and it shelters them from most products. So um, control, getting good control can be difficult. OK, and following on from that, I've uh, got a question about, uh, well, well as, as most of the caterpillars on primrose tend to be on the underside of the leaf, uh, will, will nematodes be effective there? In that particular case, um, I haven't got much experience of using nematodes against um, caterpillars. In all honesty, um, I haven't come across many people using them. They're just an option we wanted to flag up. Um, it, I suppose, it depends. Depends if they come into contact, which they may not. Um, what do you think, Alicia? I think if the caterpillar has caused enough damage in the leaf that the nematode could get into the through the leaf to the other side to the caterpillar, if they can if they can get an, a route of access, then I think they would be successful. But maybe you need to try try it on a small area and, and see see if you have any success. I think that's one of the problems with primroses where you've got a crop which is quite flat and close to the compost surface in terms of its leaf habit if, if, if yeah. you are limited in terms of systemic or translaminar products it's a real pain to get the product or the, the bio as to what to where the actual caterpillars are hiding yeah yeah and it really flags up the importance of crop monitoring because if you're doing your regular crop monitoring hopefully you'll pick them up when they're smaller when achieving control is easier okay uh, what one one here for uh, Alicia, I guess. Um, leaf hopper in primroses. Uh, we we only get leaf hopper in primroses. Uh, what do they do for the rest of the year? Uh, well, I would just they're probably on, on weed hosts then. Not that I would accuse anyone of having any weeds, but <laughs> I'm sure they will. They'll find some somewhere else to go, and then come back for your primroses. But you're suggesting it's a it's a it's it's a kind of hidden background population you've got within the in the glass house, and they become uh, more noticeable when when we when a uh, uh, pest pressure from from other pests disappears. Yes, or or when the when the conditions are favourable within the glass house to to multiply quickly. And you, I know Jude's done some work on this uh, previously, and there's some anecdotal evidence to sort of suggest it, it may, it may be the case. Although I suspect scarred is probably more common uh, in in any grain media that contains green waste. But the question is, is scarred more likely in, in, in peat free? Um, I would say less likely, just from on my experience of different growing media types. I, th I think ones that contain peat tend to re retain the moisture better and are probably more likely to be damp and encourage fungal growth for the Sierra fly, but you may have different experiences. I think there was some anecdotal evidence if you've got green compost within, within, the, uh, within the growing media, uh, be because it's organic and because it's still breaking down, that there is evidence <coughs> that, that that could encourage or attract scary fly to, to the growing media so that, that, that there is that to, to sort of think about as well but i take your point about some of the peat alternative materials being better drained and therefore there's less uh algal growth yeah. on, on, on the compost surface it would it would depend on the composition of the, of the peat free media i think okay uh and then uh coming back to both yourself and david perhaps if you want to comment will, will sticky traps catch moths and are they any good for monitoring I would say you'd ca catch a few incidentally, but you really, if you're seeking to monitor for moths, you really want to be using the pheromone traps to monitor, to target your monitoring. Um, otherwise, it's rather hit and miss. Yes, it's it's I, the luck of have, have they flown into the sticky trap or the roller trap, and, and it's as, as simple as that, really. I would agree with that. Most, most sticky traps, even regardless of, of colour, which is designed to attract insects, uh, most of the catch is accidental or incidental. The, the insects have, are drawn close and they 
and they hit the trap almost by accident and the moths probably, well, it won't be flying around where you would have normally have your sticking traps, which is why you, you need a, a pheromone lord to draw them in closer. And Mylena, just to sort of finish off, I, I, do you have any experience of using pheromone traps in, in your uh, primrose or, or caterpillar susceptible crops? Or, or is that one thing you've not tried yet? No, we didn't try any pheromones for the caterpillar. We've tried for the trips and it didn't work at all. So okay. that's why we don't use them. Okay, uh, we, we've now uh, come, well, we, we've now gone past the, uh, uh, the, the, the hour mark. So I was just going to quickly uh, thank all the presenters we, we've, we've been listening to today, uh, Alicia, uh, David and, and Mylena, and, and also a special thanks to BPA, BPOA and, and, and Chris Need and Simon for hosting this, this webinar. Um, the, the link to the recorded version will be circulated to all uh, delegates afterwards, uh, and that will be sent around in, in probably a few days' time. And just a sort of uh, quick plug for the next one. Uh, the next one will be on getting the best from biopesticides, again, uh, hosted by the BPOA and presented by ADES as part of the Bedding and Pot Plant Centre. And that will be on the 21st of October uh, at the same time. So something for your diary there. So just to say thank you to uh, all our presenters and thank you to everybody who tuned in to listen today. And I, I hope I wish you well for the uh, remainder of today. Thank you very much. Thanks all. Bye. Thank you. Bye.